Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Systems and Sustainability Echo. Uh, my name is Shreya Prasanna, and I will be facilitating our discussion today. Apologize for a bit delay in starting today. Uh, some housekeeping before we get started. These sessions are enabled for live closed captioning. If you would like to view closed captioning for this session, please navigate to the bottom of your Zoom window and select the Show Captions option. You may need to click on three dots, More Menu, at the bottom right of your Zoom screen to find this. If you're having trouble accessing this, please chat Echo IT. We are recording these sessions for later distribution through the BeWell YouTube channel. Any info you put in the chat will not be shared on these recordings. As always, please stay muted unless you're speaking and we do encourage you to speak. If you've joined by computer, your mute button is on the bottom left of your Zoom control. If you're on the phone, just press star six. We encourage everyone to join by video for the discussion portion of our sessions. Um, because there are a lot of us here, we ask you to keep your comments brief to allow space for others to speak as well. You can use the chat feature to share your comments and questions. Please note that no predicted health information is allowed in either our chat or our discussions. That includes sharing names, exact dates, relationships, or medical information in any way that would identify a person. To help us with attendance, please enter your name, affiliation, and email into the chat feature. We appreciate your support in helping us fully capture this record. To all the BWL Texas providers, please make sure to identify yourselves during the session. Uh, if you're joining via phone, please email your phone number and name to bwltx at utisca.edu. Towards the end of the session, we will send out a link for an evaluation survey. Please fill it out to be entered into a drawing for a $30 Walmart gift card. Our didactic today is about using motivational interviewing for staff coaching and supervision, and will be presented by Denny Speakley. After that, we will have some announcements, and then here's a systems case presented by a member of our learning community. As always, I encourage you all to share your questions feedback and guidance for the questions raised by our case presenter today. And with that, we will do some introductions. Um, we will start with um, our hub, uh, Kathy. Hello, everyone. Great to see everybody again today. Um, I'm Kathy Hudgens. I am a subject matter expert, part of the hub um, team. I, my background is in program building, implementation for integrated care systems, both um, for primary care and co-occurring programming, assessment of systems, funding, state health policy work, a curriculum and training support, um, had uh, about 30 years of experience in teaching. And so I'm here with you all and excited to be with you today. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you for joining us, Leslie. Hi everyone, I'm Leslie Manson. I'm very excited to join you again today as well. I'm one of the subject matter experts here with Kathy and Matt as well. And uh, my background is that I'm an international consultant for integrated care. I work on implementation, auditing, sustainability for practices doing integrated care for primary care, substance use services, peer services, and general behavioral health as well. So thank you. I'll pass it on to Matt. Hi, folks. Matt Rosa, good to be with you. My background's uh, in clinical services, administration of agencies, uh, governmental planning, and now I work full time as a consultant, primarily using the NITEX model, process improvement, quality improvement. Also, do quite a bit of evidence based practice implementation and team coaching. So, happy to be with you all today. Thank you so much, Matt, for joining us. Bree. Hello, everyone. Bri Seda or Bri Kotoa. I am one of the hub members, also part of UT Health, uh, Be Well Texas. I am the Director of Substance Use Treatment Care Services, and I've been in the field of sub-services for a little over 30 years, and delighted to be here. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Denise. Hi, I'm Denise Begley. I live in Arizona. And I have many jobs, which I'll explain very briefly when I get into my presentation. But uh, my main job is at Banner University Health Plans as the Associate Director for Crisis and Justice Systems. And then I also teach at 
Arizona State University uh, School of Social Work, even though I'm not a social worker. Thank you so much for joining us today. Kristen. Hi, I'm Kristen Young. Um, I am the clinical director at Heron Project, and I'll be presenting today on a little bit of um, who we are and the challenges we are um, experiencing right now. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Andrea. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrea Helbler, and I am the program coordinator for all the ECHO series. Happy to be here. Thank you so much. And with that, we will move on to our didactics uh, today. Um, Denise, so uh, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna just trying to share my screen again. And my hope is that you're seeing the entire slide, not my note slide. But I think we're good. Yes, it's looking great. Thank you. Hi. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm, I love motivational interviewing. First of all, I have to say that I have been teaching it over 22 years and just absolutely adore it. And it, there's just so many different ways you can use it. And uh, one of those ways is coaching and supervision. So I really feel like we need to model the behavior. Uh, just want to say disclosures. I have no commercial interests to disclose. I don't get any money from Dr. Miller and Rolnick. I wish, right? I'd be million millionaires but I, I don't. So also just the learning objectives are here. It's in a very short amount of time that we have together. I am going to try to uh, talk as fast as I can. Um, please, if you do have questions, um, use the chat or raise your hand. Uh, would love to talk about that. But uh, just using motivational interviewing, we really do try to inspire change and we really try to tap into not only our, our patients, our clientele's motivation, but also the people that we supervise. Um, you know, I think with the pandemic, we have this quiet quitting, all of these things that, that have happened. Um, I, I call it the Irish goodbye because I'm Irish and you know, people kind of just drift off. So how do we engage our staff? Um, like I said, I work for Banner University Health Plans. I also uh, work at ASU and, and I'm also a crisis intervention specialist uh, for the city of Chandler Fire Department, almost 10 years uh, with them, almost two years with Banner and um, almost 11 years with ASU. Uh, I also started during the pandemic, my own consulting uh, business. So that is me. And I used to drink about eight Starbucks a day. Anybody else like me? Yeah, I, I've, it's harm reduction now. Uh, I only have one a day, just in case you're wondering. Um, good that not too many people judge me for that. I like that. That's a good step. So you're on your way to being motivational interviewing appropriate, right? Uh, adherent. Uh, so a disclaimer, this session is likely more helpful if you've actually had uh, motivational interviewing as a foundation of knowledge. And, you know, we're just going to do a quick review, obviously, in this session. But if you want more, we can always do more, I'm assuming. <laughs> So what is one of the strongest predictors of success in the working relationship? You can use chat, you can shout it out. What would you say it would be? Good communication, yes. Excellent. So yeah, it's the, it's us. It's that working relationship. It's the communication between, um, of course, with the patients or the, the members, the clients, but also communication between teams. And a lot of times we might, you know, there's studies out there actually that say, we think we are a better communicator than we are. And so, you know, it's always good for us to kind of take a look uh, I had, you know, back in the day, uh, many, many moons ago, I had a supervisor who used to say they used and modeled motivational interviewing, but they were very strong in the directing style. So it wasn't so much motivational interviewing as more in the directing style, which is a communication style. And there are times that we need to, for safety, we need to use that style. But when we are truly modeling motivational interviewing, we are kind of taking a step back 
We're using high levels of, uh, you know, emotional intelligence to work with the individual in front of us. So there might be something that, you know, we all have our pet peeves at work and at home, of course. And there might be something that really gets us, right? If someone, maybe the reply all <laughs> to every email and people will say that or something that really gets you, maybe it's some paperwork or something. Instead of going on kind of that attack and, and going directing style, you might take a step back because the person may not realize what's going on. So we're going to use kind of just some quick examples, but knowing MI, uh, you know, and then consistently using MI, you know, is there a, a breakdown, right? Just because someone can demonstrate it doesn't mean they're consistently using it in their practice. And so that's what we kind of, you know, I'm looking at bringing in here and coaching and supervision we want to model the behavior that we want to see, which is difficult sometimes, I realize, right? Um, but without feedback, we need to get feedback. It's part of, it's natural to think that we're doing a good job, but if we don't receive that feedback. So we have coding, we have a coding lab at ASU where you can submit tapes, even with your, uh, not just with patients or uh, clients, but also with your staff members. If you want to hone your skills in motivational interviewing and be more MI adherent. Uh, so studies show that, you know, people do rate their skills, like I said, higher than they really are. So we even need mentors. We need someone to be honest with us and bounce things off of us. And I love debriefing. I love when you guys have discussions about this is what we did with this particular person. Would we do it again? Right. The same thing happens with employees. If, if we were to be posed with this uh, situation, would we go about it the same way? Because that's how we get better. And so again, you know, um, our own perceptions of our skills are often not as accurate. So here's four steps in coaching. We can do a direct observation. You see someone do something. So, you know, I just want to kind of walk through this with you all. Have you had a situation where you're paying attention, you're listening carefully, you're taking a moment to kind of absorb what's happened and maybe ask some open questions of the person that you are coaching uh, or supervising and say, you know, explain your process to me. You know, maybe they are constantly late with paperwork or a report or something, and there might be a, a reason. So if we can just take a step back and, and just say, maybe explain your process and how you do this. And we can maybe find some areas. Now, when we look at, that's the discussion, we look at, you know, what is really going on? How can we be more supportive? How can I support you in what's going on? Uh, maybe use some affirmations, give some positive feedback. But then when we look at active coaching, this is where we want to normally, it's called the writing reflex. We want to correct the wrongs, right? The person is doing. But how do we do this with permission? So we might say, is that if that's something that you are interested in and hearing? So we, we try to get them to respond. So this is the elicit, provide elicit, and get them in to engage. And then we also want to follow up. We want to monitor their their progress how are they doing so just for a moment if anybody wants to unmute themselves can you think of a situation or do you use this kind of style when you are working with a person who needs some uh, structure and coaching is anybody willing to go out there put themselves out there it's a lot easier if you don't resist me i'm just saying <laughs> I'll go. Uh, okay. I would, I love motivational interviewing and I'm so glad you're doing this, Denise. Um, I would say I'm probably the person that knows it, but doesn't use it as much as I should. So I probably think my skills are better than they actually are at this point. <laughs> However, um, I use it whenever I have a client, I work a lot with substance um, use, substance use disorder. And whenever there's a client who is ambivalent about whether or not they want to go to treatment, um, I would say this is sort of the direction that I go down. It's the gold standard. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and then, but think about it too. So it's, there is a lot of parallels between the, the clientele we're working with and then the people we supervise and coach. 
And so yeah. MI coaching can be, you can coach your patients. You can also coach your people that you're supervising. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Kristen, for offering up. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think, you know, when we look at um, using these skills, we, you know, I constantly open up the book and now the new edition is coming out, which I'm super excited about in August. I already pre-ordered um, and there's changes, but I always learn something new. I pick it up and I get reconnected with something, even though I might have read it many years ago, like 2013 was the last edition. I still like to pick it up and kind of pick things up. And what do I do with intention? So another thing with intention is really using empathy. This can also be uh, difficult at times, right? When we have to kind of, I think, deploy tactical empathy. If it's constantly, um, they don't meet their deadlines, they're really struggling, but we've got to, how can we have this discussion with them? How do we connect? And it would be, again, the same thing with uh, someone we are assisting as, as a client, uh, as a patient. So, you know, if we click back and think we were once new on a job, if this is a new person and we're trying to take them under our wing and mentor them, uh, what would we be doing, right? And and sometimes we share anecdotal uh, things. Uh, most most of the time I do that with my my employees. I wouldn't necessarily always... I, I, I always think motivational interviewing is a natural anecdote to self-disclosure because <laughs> it's really about the person, not you. But if there were times or I say, you know, I've had, it could be me, but I say, I've had times where other people have struggled with this. Would you like to kind of hear some ideas that we, you know, talked about? And again, it gives that opportunity and that openness for receiving the information a lot, a lot more. Now, to form an alliance, we look at that old uh, rule of the 80-20 rule in counseling, you know, 80%, the person's talking, 20% you are. If it's a crisis situation, because I do crisis de-escalation, I might even argue that could be a, a 95, 90, uh, you know, for the person. Because in a crisis situation, a person would rather vent and talk than be talked at. And so allowing that process, and a lot of times it helps that person just get things off their chest, honestly. Um, and we really accept this without judgment. You know, hey, I give affirmation to them. I, you know, I appreciate your openness with me and the, your ability to communicate with me on this because I think had I known this before, maybe we wouldn't, you know, it's like we haven't, we wouldn't have gotten to this point. Communication is really key. So that's that's one of the, the areas. And then I don't know if anybody's a Ted Lasso fan, but it's it, he said it was Walt Whitman, but I looked it up and it was actually wrongly um, quoted. So I just, and I think this is a big one, right? When we think about, um, when we reflect on, on these things that someone's open with us. So here's just some examples of closed versus, uh, open versus closed questions. So again, looking at these, do any of them connect with you? Do you see the difference by even just opening up that question and what it does, do you think to the receiver of that question? So we wanna be at least 50% open over closed. Expert level is 70% and above to open to close question. Now there are times that we need to ask close questions, of course, um, but they should only act as a rudder for us. Um, particular side, of course, I would wanna know, you know, yes or no on that, but there are times when we want, you get a lot more information with the open questions. Here's an example. So, I have an employee, I'm struggling with my time management. I never seem to have time to finish my work. So tell me what's working well for you regarding your time management, or tell me what's working well for you even. You know, it could be as simple as that. And allowing that person to express themselves. And if you find that there's constant roadblocks that 
you know, I don't know about you, but as I get older, and I think the pandemic did a little bit of this to me, I'm kind of a little bit of a squirrel. Like I'll, I'll be working on something and I, I get that, put that on the back burner, start working on something else. Does anybody else do this or is this just me? I feel. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we sometimes struggle for focus. And so getting to focus, that's one of the elements of motivational interviewing. It's the, one of the four processes that, that we look at processes that how do we connect? How do we focus? How do we evoke change? And planning is part of that. What we tend to do is just skip to the planning part or the action, and we don't really listen to people. So here's another one. This is for uh, looking at reflections. Um, I feel like others disagree with what I think is best for the people I'm helping. So this person was frustrated that they felt judged by others that they weren't working with this family appropriately. You've been working in this field for a long time. Describe for me what you think is the best approach. And, you know, and then through this, there might be what other approaches have you tried? Are you, op you know, are you open to other approaches? Because that's going to be a closed question, but that's maybe an opportunity for you to kind of give some of that MI coaching. You know, um, in my experience, if you're interested in hearing that, and once they give it to you in, in a session, I would like to say a coaching session, you have that ability to share. Um, but it's much more valuable when it is received um, willingly and not put upon somebody. So I like to say, don't should on people. Um, change your shoulds to coulds. You could do this or you could do that. That alone, those word changes offers choice and people like choice, even are the people we're supervising. So providing information is important. And again, here's an example of what the, ask permission, we give that information, we let them kind of marinate over it. And then we say, is that something that might work for you? Or how does that fit in with your personality? Or what do you make of that? And get their feedback on it oh, I couldn't imagine myself doing this or, oh, I hadn't thought about that. So you get to have a different, con you know, conversation. Absolutely. Should is a, <laughs> I'm selling those shirts in the lobby. Should happens, right? 1995. There we go. Um, so looking at coaching and supervision, you get that delicious sandwich in motivational interviewing and there are times if someone is doing something dangerous, by all means, you engage in that directive approach, right? You would come in and you would make sure that you, um, you know, obviously if someone's actively cutting with a knife, you're not going to be like, tell me about how that knife, you know, I want to help you. You know, obviously um, if a person, you know, I use motivational interviewing for verbal de-escalation. So I might say, I want to let you vent. Tell me your story. I want to hear what's going on. I can't tell you how many times I've used and engaged motivational interviewing in my crisis work. You've got people who are, you're seeing them on their worst day. They're super vent, you know, they're venting. And then all of a sudden this, this calming comes over them and they'll start to share their story. And, you know, you're, you're, providing these boundaries and it's safe and I appreciate you sharing that with me and you know it must be frustrating to have people not understand so it's just another area we want to ask don't tell so I like to that's back to that being curious and I think that really helps and I think we forget sometimes just the basics of MI in that sense when we're, we're working with folks and again MI as a coaching and supervision style we're going to have target behaviors. We're going to have things that we want um, the people that we supervise to improve or skill development. I'd really like to, I think you have a natural ability to do X, Y, Z. I could really see you thriving in this area. Um, you know, I'm wondering if you'd, you've ever considered that, you know, taking courses or, you know, maybe a class on Excel or whatever the, the case may be. Um, and then of course, we're going to engage the rest of our motivational interviewing skills. Um, pace is the spirit of MI, the four pillars, uh, so to speak. And I do think this type of supervision actually reduces burnout. I teach on compassion fatigue for staff and managers because 
I, I get requests sometimes and someone asked for decision fatigue training. And I said, yes, I have one. It's called motivational interviewing <laughs> because you, it lifts the burden off of you to make decisions for people. You offer choice. Sometimes we have to limit that choice. It can't be like I jokingly say, do you guys have the Cheesecake Factory in Texas? Uh, the Cheesecake Factory has like a notebook of a menu and it's too many things. It's overwhelming. So sometimes we have to limit choice. There's this or this, which one would you like to do? And I've been using these things on even my children since they were very young, offering choice. And, and they kind of, you, I see them now as young adults and they're able to kind of decide for those things on their own. And it really is helpful with conflict resolution, uh, I, I believe as well. So um, just in summary, just looking at coaching, uh, you know, we kind of look at uh, giving that positivity and that feedback, but constructively uh, with permission, uh, we can, you know, provide examples and then we really do try to repress that directing style as much as we can, of course, unless safety is an issue. So that's just kind of a quick, uh, I have some recap slides for you. Just from what I, I said, these are just good um, gold standard, um, you know, kind of boundaries here. And just, uh, I created the slide of the spirit of MI. So we know, you know, these are just, am I keeping pace? I love this mnemonic. I think they're changing it in the fourth edition, but I'm, I'm going to have a hard time with that. But am I keeping pace with the person? Am I ahead of them? Am I right, you know, using my writing reflex? Um, I also provided this as a handout. It's just little stems to help us. Sometimes I think in the area, if I, I usually do an activity where I get people in a room and I say, which one are you best at when it comes to those, um, the pace? And I'll, I'll get them in, you know, different corners of the room. And then I have them write stuff down. And then I'll say, which one are you the one that you need to work on the most, right? And that's always uh, really in, engaging and fun. So generally it's affirmations. And I think those are really, I, I bring that into my practicing positivity. So and using oars with intention is the opposite of the writing reflex. So it's, it's one of those things we really do try to focus on. So we want half of our reflections to be complex versus simple. When we're looking at motivational interviewing. And then again, this is just, um, you know, advanced stuff, but the four processes of how a lot of times we engage with somebody and we go right into planning. So we need to not miss focusing and evoking. And then here's just the basic formula. And we want to, you know, deflect that sustained talk, acknowledge it, but then pull for change talk uh, for people. And so these are just kind of avoid advice giving, even though it's tempting, that's the writing reflex. So uh, any comments, questions? I just have a little learning continuum here. And again, we can be coached as well. Um, and then here, are the, there's the new book if you're interested in getting it. I ordered it. The only place I could find it was Walmart, and I pre-ordered it. And um, But there's, of course, these other opportunities. So any questions, comments? Ways to contact me. Thank you so much, Denise. Uh, this was a wonderful presentation, and I great uh, recap for all of us. Um, yes, I, I will open up the floor for some questions or comments or even experiences. <clears throat> See a lot of shooting going on there. I love it that you guys are picking up on that. <laughs> Changing your shoulds to coulds, that alone helps. <laughs> Um, and like I said, it's tough in a, in this short amount of time, um, but if, you know, that uh, would love to explore more of motivational interviewing with you all. Absolutely, absolutely. I'd love to get a little bit of the pulse of our community, and I know we've heard from one person already, but I'm wondering how many folks here have received MI training 
uh, previously for your practices, peer uh, support. So I see a few. Oh, good. Yeah. That's wonderful. And then second is how many of you get ongoing training, just checking in? Um, is it something that's easily accessible for you? Okay. Yeah. Okay. About the same amount. That's awesome. So a lot of folks are getting MI and it looks like probably utilizing it in their healthcare systems. So that's wonderful. Are there specific needs then since you've heard a little bit from Denise already in this presentation on MI, the strengths of MI, how it can be beneficial, are there needs that any of you have that you'd like for something? Because I know Denise is also part of a large MI network and resource center. Um, so I'm wondering if there's needs that are out there from our community and perhaps that be, could be something we could follow up with you all on. Uh, so just kind of open-ended question, like if folks have anything out there. Yeah, thank you so much, Leslie. And uh, people can write that in the chat and uh, definitely any ad uh, additional suggestions for further learning on MI, we can definitely follow up with that. Thank you so much. And uh, with that, we will move on to the next part of our session. Um, Carly, if you could please share the announcements. Thank you. The Center for Substance Use Training and Telementoring provides high quality education in best practices for responding to substance use. CSTAT can help enhance professional knowledge and self-efficacy to treat, screen, treat, and make referrals for people with SUDs. To learn more, please visit us at cstat.utiska.edu. Next slide. Uh, please, uh, uh, to claim CME credits, you do have to text attend 1009-2970 by midnight today to receive credit uh, to this number uh, on screen. We will share this information on chat as well. Next slide. We have an upcoming conference, the Neonatal Abstinence of Syndrome Symposium is happening in Corpus Christi or from June 25th to 27th. You can find uh, more information at this website. We will be sharing that link in chat as well. Um, thank you. We hope to see you guys there. Next slide. Do join us for our next session on Thursday, July 27th. Eileen Lepro will be speaking about funding uh, and grants for to support SUD programs. And with that, we will move on to our case for today. Uh, Kristen, you can uh, please help summarize the case for us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Young. Um, as I said earlier, I'm the clinical director of Heron Project. I'm um, a licensed independent clinical social worker in the state of Massachusetts. Um, I obviously work for the Heron Project. I also have a small private practice on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Um, so the Heron Project, I'm not sure um, if any of you guys are familiar. We're not as well known in Texas as we are um, here on the East Coast. Um, Chris Heron was a former NBA player. He played for the Celtics and um, he lost everything due to a substance use disorder. And um, he has been in recovery for almost 15 years now. And he travels across uh, the country and talks to kids about the dangers of substance use and actually his talk has kind of transformed a little bit more now into more um, how you feel about yourself and being you um, and he ties it into substance use disorder so he has a big prevention program um, that is a uh, heron talks which is our sister program he also has a, a for-profit um, wellness center that is in Massachusetts, um, which it, it is its primary goal is uh, to combat substance use disorder as well. We are the sister program of both of those programs. We're his nonprofit. We were born um, out of in 2011 when he started speaking. Lots of individuals would reach out to him and ask him how they get help. How do they get into um, treatment? How do they get into recovery? So we were sort of born out of that. He really wanted to give back. So he formed Heron Project and we work primarily with people who um, don't have a lot of resources, although anyone can reach out to us. All of our programs are free of charge. We are very lucky that uh, we're, we're becoming a trusted organization in a lot of areas. So uh, we work primarily through private donations. We do our own fundraising and we're starting to get into some small grants uh, due to an issue we have with 
funding at this point, um, which is what we're going to get into. Um, so what we do um, is we assist individuals and families struggling with substance use disorder. We try to help individuals find their way to recovery. We help to teach families um, how to help their loved one move towards recovery. We also have a prevention program um, in schools. Um, and we have an active engagement community that consists of anybody who wants to get involved in combating um, you know, the high rates of addiction and substance use disorder we're facing at this point. Um, so our primary program where we started, as I mentioned earlier, was helping individuals move towards recovery, um, especially particularly people who don't have resources. So we used to give scholarships for people to go to, to treatment. So traditional 30 day programs. We've kind of moved away from that. So what we do now is help them use their own resources to help them get into treatment. And then we help them after the fact, because what we found was most people can find treatment, but sustained recovery is much more difficult because there isn't um, a lot of communities. Uh, obviously there's the 12 step model, which is, is awesome. And we connect people with it all the time, but there aren't a ton of communities that really stay with people. So they get connected to treatment centers and oftentimes they get discharged. They don't know where to go, or what to do after that. So we have changed our focus a little bit in the last few years to really trying to assist with that. Um, also the issue of funding coming out of treatment. A lot of people don't have a lot of resources. There aren't insurance companies that step in to pay for recovery housing. Um, so we put most of our emphasis on that now. So people will receive a seven week scholarship when they come out. Um, if they have to apply, there's an application process, they have to meet our criteria. And our criteria is basically just, we wanna see some motivation. We wanna see people who really are looking to get better and are really looking for support. We'll help them find a recovery house. We'll give them a recovery coach uh, that will actually follow them for six months. Um, and all of that again is free. So they'll receive, their rent will be paid for one month. And then every week thereafter, it goes down by 25% until the second month where they'll be responsible for their um, entire rent on their own. We do this purposefully. We're trying to get people connected into the community, doing jobs very soon after they get out of treatment um, because we know that that's what gives people the best results. So, and then we follow them. So our motto is, is that we will walk with you throughout all your stages of recovery. If somebody relapses, which we know happens frequently, we will stay with them. So we will help them get back into treatment. We will, uh, we, might, we won't give another scholarship if they've received a full scholarship. We only do that every two years, but we will help them. We'll help them find other resources. We really try to connect with individuals based on what they need um, and just stay with them regardless of where they're at in their process. We also offer groups, supported groups for family members. They're all virtual. We've been virtual since pre-COVID. I think I started the first group here about seven years ago. Um, they're for family members. They are all run by licensed clinicians. Again, free of charge. There is no exchange of insurance information or anything. They can just come um, when there's also no commitment. So they can kind of come and go um, as they need us. Uh, we found those to be very helpful. We have very specific groups for different demographics. Again, we figured out fairly quickly that there's a big difference between a spouse and a parent. Um, so we have groups for, for various different demographics. We have a sibling group. We have parents groups. We have a parent of adolescence group. We have spousal groups. We have general family groups, which are basically just anyone that loves anyone who has a substance use disorder. Um, we also have a grief group because we, unfortunately, we know that um, we're losing people and we, we don't just have a grief group. We actually, I believe we have maybe six now because um, unfortunately that seems to be our group that has the biggest need at this point. Um, so, and we offer 15 minute consults with licensed clinicians. So if a family is struggling and they need a little bit more additional one-on-one -on -one support, they can reach out and they will get um, a consult with a licensed clinician to sort of help them figure out how to move forward. We offer um, various books, reading material that we will send them for free to help them start their journey and learning about substance use disorder um, and learning how to best support their loved one. Our prevention program is Heron Project Clubs. Um, it's uh, an evidence-informed um, 
kit that we will hand out and curriculum that we hand out to school systems for free. And it's an outside of school activity club that's sort of based more in scope coping skills training and fun um, and learning how to best support yourself as, as a young person and learning how to manage big feelings. Um, and we do offer kits right now for middle school, high school, we're working on college and we're working on elementary schools. And again, that's um, it's, it's a for, if something free we offer. Um, and then we have our active engagement community where we do lots of events and runs. Um, it's our fun. It's where we do the majority of our fundraising. Um, but we also offer other events for people just to learn um, and to try to combat the stigma of substance use and substance use disorder at this point. So any questions so far on any of that? I, I said that very quickly. I wanted to try to get to all of our programs. OK, so. The biggest issue that we're um, facing I, right now, oh, Kristen, I do have a question just to yeah, sort of clarify, um, and maybe um, our community would have a question about this too. When you say follow them for six months and they have a seven week scholarship, that yeah. six month is post seven weeks, or is it six months upon discharge from inpatient? And when you say follow them, how intensive and how much time? Because when you're talking about funding, when you're thinking about scaling up, that yeah. type of intensive um, following or whatever, however you want to frame that um, could be time, you know, intensive and also costly. Yes. Um, thank you for your question. So the, when they're, our our clock would start from when they um, are discharged from treatment. So from a class, like an inpatient stay or sometimes, and we're getting more and more people are coming to us more from holdings, um, TSS, CSS, and things like that, as opposed to traditional treatment settings, because it's getting harder and harder for people to be in uh, formal treatment. So it starts then. However, we are not cut and dry in that capacity. So if somebody has reached their six month mark and they need a little bit more support, the recovery coach can come back and ask for more and we will grant it. Typically how our recovery coaching program works is usually they'll also receive the scholarship, the seven week scholarship. And for the first week, it's fairly intensive. So two or three meetings, um, person receives a plan, the recovery coach sits down with them, figure out what they need. And um, from there, it's, will be based upon the need of the individual. It's not a traditional recovery coaching program where people are getting a ton of intensive work from us. I wish we could do that. Hopefully someday we'll be able to at this point, we just can't sustain that financially. So typically they receive one to two um, meetings, check-ins, whatever the person needs a week for the first seven weeks. So they'll get at least one meeting um, if they need a ride to get uh, you know, some sort of entitlement or get a driver's license, we will also assist them with that. Once that eight weeks is up, um, it will drop down to every two weeks and then it drops down to once a month, but it really is based upon what the person needs and where they're at. So if the recovery coach is basically like, no, this person is, needs more support, we will give it to them. But the idea of our recovery coaching is to really, in the beginning, put a lot of emphasis on getting them um, connected to their own community, where they can find their own supports, which are going to be more sustainable throughout the person's recovery process. Um, so Thanks. it's the, you're welcome. So it's not a typical recovery coaching program where it's intensive, but what the hope is, is that they're going to stay connected. They're going to join our alumni program, which we also have where we do alumni, alumni events. We try to get people out to do our runs. They, our recovery coaches will always respond to someone. Even if it's three years after they've seen them, they will get, if they reach out, they'll get a response. So we really try to follow them forever and walk beside them as long as they need us. Uh, any other questions on that? And I also do want to say we are nationwide. Um, I would say the majority of people who reach out to us are from the New England area, but we actually have a fairly strong community in Texas at this point, and we have um, a recovery coach in Texas right now as well. So our Texas community is is definitely growing. So our biggest issue right now is, um, I'm sure as many organization, organizations are, are facing, especially when it comes to substance use disorder realm, is financial. And the interesting part is 
our finances, we actually have more money to put towards scholarships and we're putting more money towards it at this point than we probably ever have in the, um, you know, almost 15 years we've, we've been at this. Um, <clears throat> however, COVID was a game changer as I'm sure many of you are experiencing as well, where um, the influx now of people reaching out to us, I, well, I think it's twofold. I think we're become more, more, becoming more of a trusted organization in so many different areas and you have more people struggling than ever um, and treatment is getting harder and harder to come by especially long-term treatment so the influx right now where we used to i mean we would pretty much give 100 percent scholarships out to qualified individuals um, however now we're having to turn away somewhere between 50 to 70 percent of qualified individuals who are reaching out to us um, every month which it's it's really hard and it's it's actually you know I'm, i was really happy to to see that motivational interviewing was um you know given about staff because it's one of the hardest things that my staff is struggling with right now is knowing that we have people who are really sick on the streets um and where we used to be able to get in there with all of them we just can't anymore and it's really been a difficult shift for them so we're trying to figure out um how we can bridge that gap how we can bring in more money so we can um, help more people. Yes, Lindsay. Is your program is your program abstinence based only or do you have any harm reduction incorporated into it and are your peers certified? Mm -hmm. So the majority of our peers are certified. Um, the ones who are not certified, we're helping get certified and they've already gone through all the training. So we're providing their supervision. Um, and as far as harm reduction, we're 100% supportive of all pathways to recovery and including all harm reduction programs, we're not a treatment provider. So we're an intermediary. So we help people find their way to treatment. And if the treatment that they're looking for is, um, you know, medicating addiction, we're going to help them get there. So yes, I mean, we would support all pathways. We'll help people with, when they reach out to us, they're generally looking for like, how, how can I get better? And we'll go through all their options with them based in the area that they're in um, and we'll help them find whatever they're looking for. If they're not sure, we'll go through all of the potential options that we, they have. We'll do some research to try to help find the best fit for them, depending on what they're looking for um, or you know what, what their interests are. So yeah, we 100% support um, all, you know, all the harm reduction. Um, ways. I mean, my feeling on it as a social worker is I, I harm reduction is necessary because if we didn't have harm reduction, more people would be dying and I want to keep them alive as long as possible and try to help them get connected to their communities. I mean, we know that the opposite of active addiction at this point is connectedness, right? So we try to provide a community that they can come to regardless of what they're, even if they're actively using, we want to be a phone call that they make to say, I don't know if I want to do this anymore what can I do? Did I answer your question? I feel like I did a lot of talking there. <laughs> so the only other part of that is, is your like um, scholarships, are they tied to any type of abstinence or anything like that? So yes, um, there is an abstinence base to the scholarship program, um, but that doesn't, that's only related to the recovery house rules. So most of the recovery houses that we work with, they're going to have, um, and, and, and also to add, the reason why we paired the two was because in the beginning, when I first came on, I was the first licensed individual to come on. And in the beginning, they were just sort of giving scholarships to everyone who asked. And there were a lot of people who were in recovery houses and they were actively using. Um, and I wanted to put a program into place that where we weren't helping people get sicker where there was some accountability and the easiest way for us to do that was to give them a recovery coach. So we paired the two. Our goal is to have a recovery coaching program for everybody and anybody, regardless of what they're doing, regardless of where they're at. Um, it's not so tied to our recovery housing scholarships. We just have financially, we haven't been able to get there yet, but that is in the, in, in the broader goals. So to answer your question, can the person still receive a recovery coach even if they get kicked out of a recovery house because of use absolutely and we've done it many times so we're not just going to say we're done with you we're turning your back on you you no longer have a recovery coach because you used absolutely not we might not be able to fix their housing situation at that point but we will always offer 
continued recovery coaching. And we do have people that reach out to us that really just need a recovery coach and have zero resources. And it's not typical of what we do, but we will absolutely do it um, if we're able to and someone reaches out and that's where their need base is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question related to your funding. Uh, yeah. You had mentioned donations. Uh, do you also mm -hmm. apply for state and federal grants or do you have uh, supplemental relationships with community partners like these folks on today? Yes, um, that's a great question. We're, that's what we're doing now. So we have changed our strategic plan. Um, prior, we didn't really need it because we were able to bring in enough private donations and through our fundraising efforts. Now we really do need it. So we're doing more and more with grant work. We're doing more and more um, with community partnerships. <clears throat> we are actually in the process of partnering with YMCAs, um, Big Brother, Big Sister, to try to bring some of our services in um, into, you know, into their areas, especially when they have grants that have specifics in it about substance use disorder, we're able to sort of come in and provide that piece for them. So we're doing a lot of that now. And if you guys have any suggestions, I'm open to it because uh, we really want to be able to help more people. And, and just so you know, our statistics are actually pretty good. We had about, um, I believe, the 90-day mark for most of our individuals um, who have come out of treatment or in recovery housing. Our percentages right now are somewhere around 70%, which is really very high for this realm. Um, I think a year later, and these statistics are not super accurate because it's hard to keep people in your ecosystem, but we have about 40% of people who are still in recovery who are still connected to us a year out. So I have a quick, quick sort of a follow-up question about that. So um, if they are in supportive housing that requires abstinence, um, mm -hmm. are you having difficulty developing partnerships because of the new sort of vision for harm reduction through these community partnerships that because the focus of the funding is moving toward mm -hmm. that harm reduction model are you finding that to be a barrier we did we absolutely did um it it was really maybe two three years ago we weren't able to help people and support people in the way we wanted to because of that issue we find it's getting better that there's a lot of houses that in order to have people residing in their homes, they've had to change their policies. So, um, and, and we have enough in our ecosystem at this point that we can typically find a place for somebody um, who is using medication as one of their tools for recovery. Um, but it is still a challenge. It's not as bad as it was a few years ago, thankfully, but it is definitely still a challenge. And similar to follow up on Kathy's question, Kristen, um, when you think about Heron Project's orientation, which seems to be more toward a, an inpatient uh, mm -hmm. care followed by a sober house, um, which is not as well aligned with some of the contemporary funding models and best practice models in a lot of the uh, insurance uh, reimbursable services, right? Much more leaning toward outpatient care. I'm curious if you and or other people who are with us today have a thought about how what you're doing aligns with that broader uh care funding system yeah oh my gosh you guys are asking awesome awesome questions i actually was just talking to my director of recovery services a couple of weeks ago about this and she was basically saying we need to change our wording on our website and whatnot to reflect what we're doing right now and that is a hundred percent true um we where we used to be very focused on wanting people who are coming out of traditional treatment settings just um more because it was it was easier to access traditional treatment, which it's not now. And mo a lot of the people who are coming to us are people who are, um, you know, getting uh, getting sober in other ways and looking for recovery. But they are in the they they're not in a coming out of a traditional setting. So we are a hundred percent on board with shifting our model to meet where the demographic is at this point. Um, and coming up with other ways where we used to ask for a case manager's sort of recommendation for each person that we gave a scholarship to. Um, now we're changing it to any sort of supported party. Um, a therapist uh, would even probably take it from clergy, um, whatever, whoever the important people are that are supporting this individual, um, we've, we've shifted that. I also wanna clarify that what, we're, what I'm talking about 
is um, when people are applying for sober living or recovery housing scholarships, we will help everybody and anybody, regardless of where they're at, meet their goals. So just because somebody reaches out to us and might not at that moment qualify for a scholarship or may, we may not have a scholarship available for them at that moment, we're still going to do everything we can to help that person get to a supported environment. Um, and we'll help them find other resources, even financial resources. We have lists of other places that give scholarships. We'll help them find recovery housing. We don't just walk away because we can't give them a scholarship. My team works really hard. And that's actually one of the things they're complaining about is that it's way more time intensive to help someone when you're not giving them a scholarship, whereas it's easy to give someone a scholarship, right? So they're feeling really taxed right now because of that. Um, because it's we, we really try not to ever turn anyone away. I know we're running low on time. One of the things you asked is for other recommendations for yeah. um, types of funding type sources. I will recommend um, most states across the United States receive some extra money to support and supplement uh, mental health engagement activities and learning. It's very mm -hmm. strict. And so uh, that would be a great one is to look at some of the school districts because they do have some dollars to support these packages that you're creating and you're donating free. Mm -hmm. They might be able to use some of the taxpayer kind of money that they've been receiving related to that to support the, some of those services. So that might be one is just looking at the school districts and engaging yeah. related to that. Right. Um, so just to kind of say that, and as well as of obviously, there's a lot of other grant opportunities that might support some of your services. If you, mm -hmm. you know, carve them out and said recovery coaches, the certified peer, you know, specialists, like thinking about how do we just look at one of our areas and get uh, support for that. There are definitely grants that support different areas that you have, mm -hmm. maybe not the entire picture, entire package, right? yeah. Um, yeah. but if you could kind of kind of separate, that might be a better way to allocate and look for that, including the Hogue Foundation um, in Texas, who does a lot of this, okay. at least for the state of Texas as well. Okay, great. Just I'll that write, that, write that down. Thank and you. And then partner with your community organizations to write these grants, because yeah. only coming to you as the, the purveyor is, is probably not helping those partnerships grow. And I feel like you should be applying as a co-nonprofit applicant yeah. for some of the funding. Yep. We've, we've definitely been finding that and we're really trying to do that now. Thank you. And not to mention why recreate the wheel, right? The more we can work together, the better. Mm -hmm. and, and you've got a great community here. Oh, sorry, Kathy. Go no, for that, it. That's what I was going to say. You've got a lot of people here who probably would love that support. So it sounds like we probably need to go ahead and do a wrap up because we have one minute left, in fact, less than a minute. So just really quickly, um, I, you know, the presenter for MI did a nice job of doing her own wrap up, but just remember to use your MI skills when working with staff and staff and supervision to keep motivated to reduce burnout. Um, also, when you're for an organization like Kristen's, make sure that you partner with your, your community agencies, you stay up to date with current models um, that reflect the um, and align with emerging uh, recovery models and then funding priorities from your funders, and that you work very, you know, hard to do what you're doing, Kristen, which sounds like you're doing a great job of following people through and not giving up on them. Thank you so much, Kathy, and thank you so much, Kristen and Denise, for sharing uh, today and, uh, and joining us today. Thank you all for joining us for this wonderful session. It has been a great learning alongside all of you. Please do remember to uh, claim your CME credits before midnight today. The information is on the chat right now, and we'll see you next time. Um, our next session is on Thursday, July 27th. Have a wonderful summer. Bye.